Welcome to today's session, which is on managing and managing subordinates, managing other people, and creating a team work culture that is efficient, where people like to work. And this is more important than you think, because about 70% of people at their work are in some grade, some level checked out. They're not engaged with their heart and with their creative ideas because the work environment doesn't know how to uh, respect and how to tap and how to engage with them in such a way that the person feels like bringing their 100% into work. Okay, so with that point of view, is, this topic is very, very important, especially if you're a young manager in the first 10, 15 years of your career and you haven't quite you know, picked up your management style yet. And you'll be watching and you'll be learning and you'll be figuring out things. And depending on how successful you are, how good a role models you have, you'll pick up either good styles or you'll pick up some insurance style, CYA, they call it, you know, how to just protect myself and still manage. And then you become an average manager and then you're part of the crowd that's creating the 70% people that are not engaged. <laughs> okay, so that's today's topic. We're going to begin by first talking about what are some standard known issues with uh, team, team cultures? And then we're going to tell you, after that, we'll go straight into what you need to do. Okay. And then we're going to talk about how to do it. So first is common problems. What do you need to do? How to do it. Great. Okay. First, in the previous uh, show, we talked about how to manage your, okay. ma uh, manage your boss, boss. <laughs> and especially how to manage a difficult boss. Mm. And in this one, we are trying how to, to manage your subordinates. subordinates. Yes. Okay. Wonderful topic. Right. Welcome to the online samosa. I'm Yamini Mitter. Yes. And this is I'm Sandeep Tiwari. Namaste and welcome. Okay. Let's get started. Yes. Right. So managing subordinates and, and, and creating a team culture is an important part of what you are trying to uh, ultimately create within your company, create within your organization, because until you create that, it becomes, uh, you get a default culture. Let me explain default. Default culture is there are members in your team that have already been working in the workforce before you joined. Okay. And they have picked up some work culture and some method to engage with their company from their previous good or usually bad experiences. So all of those people are bringing in the existing work culture from other companies into your company. So if you don't work it, you will end up with the default culture, culture that they brought in average. Okay. And usually the averages don't average up, they average down. Okay. But they can, they ultimately they average, but not so up as you think, which means that you have to invest into your department into your company, you have to actively work towards a work culture that is pleasurable, efficient, respectful, and that engages all of the creativity of your employees. Okay, so now the, there are a few reasons, so I'll list them. There are some main reasons by which, due to which people disengage from their current job. There are two kinds of disengagements. One is my body shows up, <laughs> I do the basic work that I, is required for me, but none of my real heart, my creativity shows up because I'm disengaged. That's one level. The next is my body definitely shows up. And until you force me to get my mind engaged, I basically do the, the job. Right. And I do it in such a way that I ask you and I do it and I ask you to do it. So you feel that I'm doing a good job because I'm asking you, but I'm really only doing the minimum. And you just that's how, that's that's what I'm doing. So the first one is I'm a little bit more engaged, a little bit less engaged. Then the least engaged is I quit, <laughs> disengaged. <laughs> okay. So there are three levels or two major levels of this of disengagement. One is I'm still there but not there, and the other is I'm not even there. I quit. I'm gone. Okay. So disengagement reasons are as follows: one, the work environment was unfair. Due credit was not given to people for their good ideas, and due you can say reprimand, punishment, or called out. People were not being called out for doing bad jobs or bad things. Okay. So bad people were getting promoted. Good people were getting ignored. Unfair. Second is disrespect. And you don't, I don't feel respected here. Meaning I suggest an idea. Someone thanks me, but I don't feel respected. Meaning they, you, they, you listen to my idea, but you don't even do it. But you thank me. You were very nice. You were very kind. You made me feel heard and everything else. Right. So respect. 
So in the first one, you don't even hear my idea unfair. When you heard my idea, you took it and call it your idea unfair, right? Second one, it's my idea, you thank me, right? But you don't do it, right? So, and if it's not right, you didn't engage with me to figure out how to make it work. It was like, not much, right? Then there is disrespect where I have values I live with, right? Honesty, hard work, or some of the many other good values, good listening, right? Respectful behavior with other people, not being bullying, not and I can have all kinds of values, but my values are not being respected here. So then after a while I feel I can't really be myself, right? I have to follow through the values of your culture. So I be after a while it's not or I quit or I disengage. Okay. Then the third reason of course is money. Right? You're not paying me enough money. I got a better job. But because you're already losing me on Point number one and two, I don't even tell you I have a better job because I don't want you to come and counter bid and keep me. I really just want to leave. So money is not the main reason why people leave, but money is a trigger why people end up leaving or they tell you they're leaving for more money, but they didn't even give you a chance to catch up. Right? Then I feel unsafe. I don't feel I'm valued. So these are different ways people describe their <laughs> engagement <laughs> or lack of uh, respect or la some, something that is missing, right? Many of these fall into the same first two buckets, basically, dis unfair and disrespect, right? But I don't feel valued, meaning I don't feel I'm really, you know, I, I want a job in which I'm making the world better, maybe, and your, your company is making it worse, you're selling tobacco or something, you know? So I don't feel valued. And I feel, I don't feel I'm cared for. Because there are times when the company needs extra stuff from me. Can you stay an extra hour? I do that. And then, and then I call and say, hey, my kid is sick or something and you don't care. So when you need something from me, you want me to care. But when I need something, you don't care back. So I don't feel cared. I feel you need me to care, but you don't want to care about me. So uncared is another reason. Another reason that people leave in their mind is uninspirational management. Management is not inspiring. So these are the kind of the way most people describe why they become disengaged with the company or with a work group or with a team. So let's go straight into the next step. I can explain to you why and all of that, but I'd rather first spend some valuable time explaining what you need to do, how to fix it, or how to not land up in that soup. First is, and most important for you, is to try and make it a goal, your personal goal as a manager, that you want to be an inspirational manager. You want to have that goal, personally speaking. Because once you make that goal, you will become all ears and all books. You'll be looking for ways to be an inspirational manager where you inspire other people. And I'll show you in our set, third part of this recording how to do it. Okay? But first, I just want to tell you, you must make this goal. I want to be an inspirational manager. And the goal of the inspirational management is I want to make people perform their best when they come to work. Okay, then I want them to feel like they're solving problems when they're at work, not just show to work and do the job and leave, you know. No. You must feel you're engaged enough that you want to solve problems and you're solving problems. Okay, that's part of my inspirational management goal. Then it is to, you must want to create solutions. You must want to create solutions to problems and challenges and friction that exists in day-to-day -day work and sometimes not day-to-day, -day, big, big work. So you, I want you to be inspired such that you are creating solutions. And then I want you to be mentally engaged, right? I want you to feel satisfied when you, when you solve something. I want you to feel the team satisfaction that I belong here, I care for them, they care for me, satisfaction, okay? So this is your goal. Then your next goal as a manager is or, or what you need to do, the second thing you need to do, because the first one will take time and over time you'll pick it up and I'll show you how and then you can speed that up. Okay? The second one is, I want to create a fair work environment. You have to make that a goal. I want fairness. Fairness is very important to me. And in fairness, there are following points that are critical that count. One of them is everyone, including me, must give credit wherever it is due. And I must create a culture where other people are looking to give credit wherever it's due. And that includes yourself. So say I did some big heavy lifting and then two people helped me. Then I will say when I report it, these two people helped me and the credit goes to the three of us. That's how I tell my boss. So you don't forget yourself when you're giving credit. That's, 
is that that world where you expect that other people will just give you credit and you will only give other people is is gone. <laughs> it's busy world. People are too busy. Okay, so you will just report as plainly as you can, right? But if you just say I did all the work and you never give credit to other people, then you are in that boat, right? And then you are not in the fair boat. So fair people give credit, but calculating people only give credit to non-competitive people. You know what I mean? Like, okay, if I give credit to me and this other guy who's really also very good and this other third guy who's also a guy or girl, right? Who's also good, but no, the third person is no competition. They will never ever get my job. They have some other liabilities, <laughs> skills that they're missing, right? So if I give this guy, this other person who's like me, skill like me, give credit, then he might get a promotion. So I'm going to not give him credit and I'm going to give the third person a credit because that's no competition. That way I will always shine. Basically, I found a way to just give myself credit, right? And I can look good that I gave other people. When you have this kind of behavior, you will always be caught. Bosses aren't stupid, okay? Meaning they're not that ignorant. And that person will notice. And five other people in your department will notice you didn't give credit where it was due. And they will not work for you. They will not do your jobs for you. And you'll find all of a sudden that you're having to go up to boss every time you need to get something done because nobody is really cooperating with you. And you say, hey, he's not cooperating. Can you, can, can you call him and make him co cooperate with me? And then I, then as a manager or as a CEO, I know right away, you're the bad apple. So if you're a bad apple in a team, you can never hide. If you think you can hide, go go start your own company. <laughs> or go do a single person job. Not, not, don't do any teamwork because you cannot hide. And then you'll feel bad that people are picking on you. And then you'll, you'll lose self-esteem and then you'll say, I, I don't like to work. People are just too political for me. No, no, you're selfish and it came out and sorry. Okay, so I have to explain all this to you. Let's come back. Okay, then the third method of being fair is to take responsibility. What does that mean? That means, say you were in charge and something didn't work out right, right? The problem didn't get solved, it became worse. You say, ah, it's my fault, or my attempt didn't work. We tried, I really tried, I thought this would work, it didn't work. We are looking for help, we need solutions, we need ideas. Take responsibility, why? Because a person who takes responsibility for a failure is still a positive person who's trying to solve the problem. And that's what the company wants, okay? If all you're doing is talking about your successes and passing the, the failures onto other people or ignoring them, then you're not learning and the team is not learning and the company is creating a liability because of you. Don't be so shallow as to think that your promotions and your bonuses will come just because you only have successes. They will not, sorry, okay? Good managers know what management is and they know when they see it. And if you're, if you just missed Mr. Good, good, good all the time, something is wrong. All right. All right. Okay. So take responsibility. Okay. Now there's one part that's important here. That's a caution. Okay. So your goal in creating a fair system is to make sure that nobody gets to do self-promotion, including you. Always credit goes wherever it's due. And you're not trying to kind of uh, be selfish in other ways. And you have to let your team know that you don't tolerate that. You have to say it up front. And then when people do it, you have to catch them and then either talk to them privately or in public, depending on you know, how open your culture is. Okay. So the second thing is we create a fair environment and there's some, some things that go there. The third is to create a respectful place of work. You, so you think respectful and fairness are the same thing. No, there's a difference. Respectful means that I respect people's ideas even if I don't use them. But more respect means I respect your idea, I tell you why I can't use it, and I give you a second and a third shot to fix your idea until I can use it. Respect. Respect is to, now you see how I can be fair by saying that's a good idea, thank you so much, and, and then tell you, sorry, we didn't use it because the other idea was slightly better, right? That's fair, right? What we talked about earlier, fair. But here I'm talking respect. In respect, I do more than just be fair. I respect and grow you 
Growing you and growing my, your employees is part of real respect. Not growing them is disrespect. Yeah? All right. So you respect people's ideas. You respect their creativity, whatever they have. Not everyone has creativity. You respect whatever skills they bring to work. You, you respect their talent. You respect their connections. Sometimes you need people with connections who can get stuff done. You respect their energy. And energy we'll talk about more later on. And you respect their team spirit as you build it and they gain it. Okay? Then you respect their time. Time is very important and difficult to respect. Why? Because say you're having a meeting with 25 people in the room and somebody brings up really obscure, unimportant points, but that's all they got, right? <laughs> they don't have anything important to discuss. So you say, you have to basically respect the time of everybody else by saying, I need to cut that short. That's going to use up the team's valuable time to hear you out because we are respectful, right? And we are being fair. Everybody gets to speak. Nobody interrupts you. No, you can't do that. When an unimportant point is being raised for more than a few seconds, you have to say, I'm going to discuss that with you one on one. We already know about this. I'd like to hear more about that, but can you please write it up and then bring it up? And we want to just blah, blah. You want to cut it, you have to cut it. Because other people's time is respectful and team time, team energy is respectful. And you can't use, let somebody diffuse everyone's energy with some un unimportant discussion. Team energy is very important. That's why I said energy. Okay. So time is like this. Then you must respect other people's work effort. Because they not, may not be successful, but they made a lot of effort. Or whatever effort they made, you say, that much effort you made. Oh, you know, I, I saw you made that much effort. That other guy made even more effort, and he was also unsuccessful. So let them know, like, yeah, I'm fair. You made less effort, it didn't work. He made more effort, it didn't work. Or you made more effort, it worked. <laughs> You have to gauge. Fourth thing, your, your goal as a manager is to energize people. When people come to work, they come from their home environments, their apartment single environments, their friend is their TV environments, their friend is their cat environments, and they're not always energized. You as a manager are responsible for energizing the work environment, which means each individual has to be energized and you have to now figure out how to energize people and how to energize your team. And there are lots of techniques for doing that. And there's a lot of inspirational abilities that you need to develop, you may not have them. Because there's a lot of giving. Not everyone is a giver. They don't know how to give energy to other people because they say, nobody's giving me energy, I'm, I'll be depleted. Why should I do that, right? So you have to learn how to give without depleting your energy. Oh. Because if you give by depleting, that's not giving. That's just loaning your energy and then taking it back when you need it, just when they need it most. And then people go, oh, they don't like that. Okay. All right, energizing. So we'll talk about it. So to respect, you have to respect your energy. You have to respect their energy. You have to respect other people's energy. And you have to respect the creation of energy. And yes, we go. Okay, so these are your four major goals as a manager. Okay. Now, you'll notice I did not include in here educate. Okay. Because education is not a goal. Education is how you do one of these four things. You cannot have, you cannot just keep stuffing your goals list with hundreds of goals. It doesn't, doesn't work. Four is a lot. <laughs> in fact, only this, ultimately, this boils down to two things. Okay. Just insp uh, inspir inspiring people and creating a healthy work environment. Which includes fairness, respectful, energy. Right? That's how you think. But these three have to be called out, so you, you are careful about it. Okay, let's go to the next stage of our. Well, video. before you go to yes, the next, yeah, yeah. what I noticed was respecting with their with their ideas yeah. and uh, respect the work efforts. Yes. Isn't it on the very close? No, effort means I don't have an idea. Hmm. I have hard work. I have muscle. Okay. So you, I want to respect the person who did the hard work of putting his muscle and time in. No, no new ideas came out of me. Okay, but you're respecting the hard work. Hard work and okay. ideas separately. Separately. Because there are two separate contributions of that. Employee. Yes, because some may have the ideas, some may have the hard work. And some may have both, both. and some may have neither. Uh -huh. then, I, then I need to energize them. Ah, uh, got it. That's a good point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. okay. Now, how? How? Okay. Good question, Yamini. Okay. So... For example, how do you accomplish these things? How do you create the work culture? 
So I'm going to have to give you some examples because th there's too much how, but the example will get many things clear. So for example, when you have your weekly review meetings with your whole team or bi-weekly or once in two weeks, right? Whatever it is. Then how do you run the meeting is important because in the meeting, you are going to be bringing all of these four ideas in to create the work culture. So I'll give you some how, okay? So for example, in a meeting, you can talk about all the to-dos that you agreed upon in the previous meeting. So you review by saying, last time we met, we agreed to do these things, let's review where they are, right? Did they get done or not done, blah, 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 right? So that's one of the items you have to discuss. Then, then you ask people, what are the challenges and friction that we are facing? Because our goal is this. So you begin the meeting with our goal remain this, and we are about this percentage of, the, of our success rate into the goal, right? This progress we've made, that's how you start your meetings. And then you say, here are the to-dos from last week or last time we met, and what's their status, boom, boom, boom. You ask each people that were given a to-do where they're at. Then you ask those same people, what are their frictions? Then you ask everybody else in your job, how are you doing? And you can do a one by one, each person if you want to get a few minutes. And each person gets to talk about what are their friction points, right? How, what can we do to help you? So then you say, don't just start solving the frictions because you're trying to create team and energy, right? So if someone is having a friction and that friction can be solved with this other person helping them, then you don't say, oh, this other person will help you. Back off. Then you say, oh, they're having a problem. This is their friction. Any ideas from anybody? You look for ideas. And somebody, you, some people might give ideas. At some point, you ask that person who's supposed to, who you think will help them solve it. What do you think? And they'll say, I suppose I could help them. Oh, that's a great idea. So, so you're getting buy-in, right? You're getting buy-in from the person that was going to help by them suggesting it, they kind of feel ownership. And there are other ways to create ownership. I'm just giving you an, 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 a lame or a simple example. But your goal is to energize at the same time as solve the friction. Not just, I'm, I'm the key problem solver. Every, everything comes to me, I solve it. If I don't show up for two days, everybody, everything goes to <laughs> underwater. <laughs> no, it's not what you're doing. You're creating a with the boat can float without you. So this is what you do. Then you help pick solutions or you try to improve the quality of suggestions and solutions being given because the solution I may be just incomplete idea, right? So you try to encourage that and you try to brainstorm that appropriately within that much time if it's available, right? If not, then you say, okay, three of you come into my office, we're gonna brainstorm that. We're not gonna use up the team time, but talk. right? Then you respect ideas, you respect time. Make sure people aren't just blabbering too much or they're talking ap appropriately. Then you have to practice the listening of all challenges. You will hear all kinds of friction challenges. And you have to remember as a manager, you cannot solve all. And it's not your goal to solve all in, a, in one meeting. You have to prioritize in your head by saying, okay, we're going to solve these three. The rest are not going to be addressed today for another day. If you have some ideas about that, think about it. Let me know. If you have some, another idea that you think might work, just do it. Don't tell us about it. It's okay. So that way, nobody can hijack your meeting by raising up some obscure point as a friction, and they know that you are one of those problem solvers who solves everything, and not five hours later, everyone is de-energized. <laughs> or even one hour later, they're de-energized because you're solving a not an important problem. So don't get hijacked. Then assign new tasks to people to solve the issues and challenges and friction you're facing. Now, then, I like to do this, it's very important, is I discuss people's energy levels. I say, so since last week, you got this is done, a few things didn't get done. How's your energy level? Ask them up front. And they'll say, oh, X, Y, Z is happening in my private life. Okay, good to know. Now I understand why it didn't get done. Thank you, energy is low. Or they'll, they'll give you some reason. And you can say, hmm, I don't want to discuss that in public. I'll, have, I'll solve that with you privately. I can... But you know, I know, everybody else knows you have a low energy problem because I asked you and you gave me a deflated answer, right? That helps other people also be a good team support to you by saying, oh, let me see if I can help them. They're dying low on energy, right? Or other people will say, I already helped that person five times. I'm not gonna help them anymore because if I keep helping them, they will never learn. Sometimes help isn't that I do your work for you. Sometimes help is, I don't do your work for you. I don't do anything until you find the gumption within you to either ask for help 
or raise your energy level because you realize this job needs energy and if you don't bring energy in, there's no job. Right? So all of those communications are healthy. Okay? In fact, some of the other videos that if you watch, there's a bunch of videos that will tell you that let people know that they can't be late. Let people know they're not, that if their work is not good quality, that I have other people I'll hire and I'll replace them. They tell you to be hard on your team, mm -hmm. not because you'll actually replace them, but because they know that it works. Many people respond to a dire circumstance before they're energized. It's unfortunate because they come from the default <laughs> work culture, right? Which is not a healthy work culture. And then this kick helps them realize, oh my God, I better, I better kick into gear or I don't have a job, right? So that's one way to motivate people. But in that method, you never get creativity and you don't get brainstorming and you don't get their heart in, right? If, if a person is working under the fear of being fired, you will get other things, but not these. And an inspirational manager doesn't want a person who's just there with their brawn mm -hmm. and their skill and no ideas and no creativity. I don't want that. I don't want that. Because they pollute your team. They're the bad apple. The rest of the people also become like you after a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. So culture, oh, it takes a lot of work, but it takes a lot of thinking, right? All right. More things. So discuss energy levels. The last one is in this how to have a meeting is to have meeting notes and share the meeting notes everybody sees right mm -hmm. this is where we are and everybody knows that if i don't do my job everybody knows if i do my job everybody knows right so credit get credit for this team. Okay. then the next part then next major tool for you as a as a manager is meeting with your subordinates or other people that you're managing one-on-one -on -one. so group meetings one-on-one -on -one meetings in one-on-one -on -one meetings something similar but you, are, you can accomplish more things such as you can discuss private issues. You can discuss their personal goals. You can give them a higher goal so they feel energized because sometimes when people know there's a higher goal that I may achieve a bigger, higher thing, it may be worth doing it. It excites me. So now I bring in my A game, right? Discuss their energy at all, how you can, how you can help improve it, right? Solve issues that you can. Don't solve issues that you can't. Tell them to go and seek help outside for solutions that you are, cannot or should not give them, but encourage them to get it from outside, okay? Or from colleagues or whatever. So that's basically how you work on one-on-one -on -one and help them to become a person who seeks solutions rather than complains, okay? So you want them to be a positive person, meaning I'm looking for solutions kind of person. All discussion is not, is to seek a solution, not just to vent and go empathize and feel sad and walk away, you know, a little lighter. That's not a work, that's your, you know, after work gossip, go have fun with that if you, if you have that. In fact, don't do that. No. All right. But that's their private life, they do whatever they want. Now, the third part of how you do it is you set goals for your group, for your team, for your individual. You have, you set high expectations, you set clear goals. You make sure that goals are being accepted by both sides, you and them, and you get commitment. Now, what else can you do? You can teach by example. Don't just teach by preaching. You do it. You do the work with them. You find somebody's weak, you say, hey, let me step in with you. I'm going to join your team for a week or two weeks. Start working with them, with your, you know, role of preaching. Do the work. If they're doing some physical work, they're doing some, you know, negotiation with the vendor, you just say, I'll take the call. I'll, you know, just watch him, you know, two of us will call together. Work, teach by example. Okay. Then, the, and I have made many points on this, but, the fourth and very important is practice power listening. And that is something you have to watch in one of our previous videos. You have to learn what power listening is. And it's a, it's a, it's a big topic. Okay. You cannot be a manager and you can definitely not be a good manager if you don't practice power listening and you don't respect uh, work. Work meaning that not everybody is hierarchical in their head. It's an example. For example. Some people are quite happy in their position and they are satisfied. They feel they're bringing enough value in their job at whatever level they're at. And, and there have been times when I've, took, I've taken a person who was an excellent guy. So I want to promote you. He says, no, don't promote me. I don't want, I don't want that headache. I love my job. Mm -hmm. I'm good at it. I said, but I need somebody. He, you know, he just said, no. I said, okay, I need you to help me temporarily anyway <laughs> until I hire somebody. He said, okay, I know I can do your manager job, but I don't want it. So I'll help you, but don't worry. Right? So, so respect what is called um, work. Not everybody needs to be praised and moving up. 
you might be ambition, right? So you must have respect at the appropriate level. And it's part of power listening. So you have to go watch the power listening and then do that. Now, um, people have a need to be fully heard and feel that they've been heard because it impacts and activates their brain at many levels. So if you are not a good power listener, it's not going to work. So those are some hows. And, and uh, what I want to talk about here just before we, now we're going to close this, is if you have specific questions and you have some help that you need one-on-one, -on -one, right? please reach out to us. So we, I do coaching. I do life coaching. If I have a bandwidth, I have availability. Because many times people have some specific, specific problems that they're challenged that they're facing, either with their team or with their boss. So you can reach out to us and, and we can help you with that more privately and more in, in specifically with your issue. Okay. So I'm Sandeep Tiwari. Thank you very much, Sandeep. And I think whatever you said uh, towards the end, I have seen you doing it with your employees when I was <laughs> yeah, working for you. Yeah. And I do see that, you know, you whatever you are teaching, yeah. Yeah. You're preaching too. Oh, thank you. All the both of some other ways. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't work. Doesn't, if I don't have yes. experience. Yes. Okay. And it's very rewarding. It's awesome. Yes. So thank you so much. Keep listening to us and keep, please subscribe to our channel. Yes. Namaste.